So the, this work around escape velocity, I was just listening to all the chairs reporting out, and it's, we're all in this same zone of, it, it's fundamentally an exercise in change management. Uh, the subtitle of the book, Free Your Company's Future from the Pole of the Past, is a, just a testimony to how organ, resources want to stay where they are. And they, once resources get allocated, and they get comfortable, and they get in position, and they begin to develop inertia around programs, it's extremely difficult to reorient them. And, and it's, a, it's a lifetime job. The good news is there's lifetime employment in this. I remember, I used to teach a positioning exercise, and it was like, you had to explain your company in like one sentence in an elevator. And the person who won it the best by far was the guy uh, from the Caterpillar company. And he got up and he said, you know, my name's so-and-so and I'm with the Caterpillar Corporation. Uh, we're in the earth-moving business. Fortunately for us, much of the earth appears to be in the wrong place. <laughs> so if you think about the earth that we manage, that all of us manage in these organizations, if you think about what, what we have, I want to take as a starting point a kind of a, 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 a bromide from economics, which is economics is the study of the allocation of scarce resources that have alternative uses. And when you think about our world, the world that unites this room here, the scarce resources we have is volunteered time and contributed funds. And they have alternate uses. And we're always competing at the margin for volunteered time and contributed funds. That's, and those, th these are the resources that once they get allocated, want to stay allocated wherever they are and when you have disruptive change, you want to move these resources to a new point of attack. And it is not that the resources lack the goodwill or the competence to move to that point of attack, but it is simply the inertia of, the inertia of social relationships and social organizations and structures that makes that much, much harder to do than, than, than one would wish. And so the key question here, and I mean, I think, it, I think this is almost a preaching to the choir question, are your scarce resources trapped in the pole of the past? You bet they are. By the way, that includes you, okay? It, your time, your calendar, your, your everything around you. It, it, and by the way, we couldn't exist if that weren't true. The past is our friend as well as a foe, right? It's only when the past gets radically disrupted that we have this challenge of, okay, at what point do I change my seat, right, uh, uh, going forward? Can we leverage digital innovation to free ourselves from the future? I mean, obviously the opportunity is just ginormous, but the opportunity of getting my organization onto a new platform and how many times can I actually do platform change and still do the work of our organization? That's, that, that's what the work of the next three days is about because those are not trivial questions and there aren't obvious answers to them, but it's important that you have clear answers to them and that at the end of the day you make bets. We call them decisions, but they're not decisions, they're bets. Right? And you're gonna make some bets about what we're gonna do and how far we're gonna take it. And what I wanna share with you now is just some frameworks to help you think about those bets maybe a little more clearly and to help your organization work with you to, to work through those bets. So we wouldn't be making these bets, we wouldn't be having this dialogue if there weren't this, this sort of wave after wave of disruption that Hugh and Don were kind of uh, alluding to earlier on in, in their remarks. I started in this uh, industry in the late 70s. Um, the, big, the big first decade was largely about re-engineering the world around me, uh, office automation. There was some back office uh, data processing that was, going, that was equally massively disruptive, but it didn't, it didn't show in the human sphere anywhere near as much as, as the personal computing did. In the 90s, the huge change was the internet, but again, it, it had a much bigger change on business processes than on human processes in the 90s. This was actually the, this was the globalization of the, of, the, of the value chain, first with manufacturing, largely going to China, elsewhere as well, then the, the, the customer service, uh, a lot of that work went to India, elsewhere as well. It kind of completely re-engineered the planet, has moved enormous amounts of wealth around the planet, I think largely for the good, but certainly for the challenge of those of us who had more privileged positions. But again, not socially not disruptive societally disruptive perhaps, but not socially disruptive. In the last decade, we beca digital became very, very personal. And I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, but, but, but those, the, all of a sudden the digital world became, invaded the family and invaded the personal life. It has become the overwhelming center of the adolescent life. 
Uh, if for those of you who have teenagers, you know, the, you know, look up, look up, look up. You know, don't talk to me with your thumbs. Uh, uh, but you know, but 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 that's going. But it's but it, but all of us, and we're all standing around doing this. What you're know, stroke, you know, every one of us, right? So huge impact. And now, in this decade, it is the challenge of the business organizations to re-engineer all of their consumer and personal facing systems to incorporate a digital endpoint instead of a personal analog endpoint. And, and the amount of re-engineering here, it's about two thirds of the economy is a consumer economy. If you now assume that any consumer facing interaction has to be digitally enabled, digitally connected, digitally re-engineered, think about how much work that is. Think about how much that is. And in particular, in a society, and this is a room full of people that run societies, where communication and collaboration is the deliverable. You know, it's not the deliverable at Safeway. Safeway, it's milk, you know, cookies, bread, whatever it is. But in a society, it's actually dialogue. We have to come, the need to re-engineer that dialogue. And, and it's so challenging, particularly if you're older, and I'm representing a demographic which is in becoming increasingly irrelevant. But, but if you're older, you're, digital, you're not a digital native, as Don Tapscott likes to say. You're a digital immigrant. And how much of my brain am I going to contribute to learning the new system and still have any left to actually say something, right? A a right? I mean, it, it, this is why these things are not as obvious to adopt a a as one would wish. So here's, what, here's how IT has kind of played a role in this thing. And, and the, in the 20th century, when we were doing the office automation, then we we're doing the re-engineering of the value chain, we generated huge numbers of transaction systems. Basically, they were database systems. We put the entire global footprint, we digitized the work effort, we turned it into transactions that could be entered into computers, and we captured transactions everywhere. And we spread that model across the globe, and, and, and we, you know, it was a data processing model. It was a very intellectual model. It was not an emotional model. Very, very rational, very intellectual. Um, and the key thing was, it was not focused on human beings. This was not, this was not intended for human beings. If you interfaced with one of these systems, you were expected to learn the system. The system was not expected to learn you. There was training and support. There were manuals. And, 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 and mostly, you tried to get somebody else to do it for you, kind of, kind of stuff. Now, the importance about these systems, these systems are still here, and they're still necessary. They run the world. But they consume our scarce resources. Every time you expose a volunteer to, 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 to this thing, you actually waste volunteer time. And often a lot of volunteer time, and you often demotivate a, a, a volunteer. And when you put funds into these systems, nobody sees the money coming back. Now, they don't run for free, but nobody experiences the return on these systems. So what's happening in the, in the globe at large is we're trying to maintain these systems, a little bit like the interstate highway system. We built the interstate highway system. We're not going to build it again. We're going to maintain it. Sometimes well, sometimes not so well. Right? But, 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 but there's a kind of a reluctance to put more money into this thing, and there's a feeling like pe people sh should be protected from these things. I wanna, the reason I'm mentioning that is that that's still the way most of our colleagues think about IT. If you say IT to somebody, you know, you're an enterprise IT. This is, I think, what they think of. What's happening in the 21st century is the rise of consumer IT has completely changed what IT is. And, and there, there's, there's three, we call them systems of engagement, what you experience in the consumer world, as opposed to systems of record, which is what we experienced in the back office world. And in the systems of engagement world, there are three things that you just, you just I, I think are the universal pillars upon which this are building. The first one is access. That Arab Spring is, is a great example, but just start with the fact that just you can get to any fact in the world. You know, you can, I, I now love the dinner conversations out with our kids because if somebody says, I don't know, who was the other actor in the second episode of Planet of the Apes? I don't know. Oh yeah, it was so-and-so, right? I mean, so, so there's all this information of any kind, uh, for whatever reason, uh, amazing. If, you, if you're into food, you can find anything about food. If you're into sports, you can find anything about sports. If you're into politics or news, I'm so sorry for you, but, you know, but, you know, but there's a lot of that stuff too. But anyway, it, it, it's, it's universal. Having said that, in its first iteration, it was intellectual. 
It was primarily a text-driven thing. You could, it was like being at the Library of Congress at your fingertips. What changed that was broadband. So now all of a sudden we went to broadband, we got video, now we're getting HD video, we're getting video, FaceTime, we're getting Skype, we're getting all these, these, these media, which is making it much, much, much more immediate. So that I can play a ukulele on top of a building to a girl, you know, Google Glasses, right? Okay, it's a little far away, but not very, but not very. And the point is, Facebook and other things showed with pictures and videos, this is, this is when it became emotional. This is when it became personal. This is when kids started to say, I feel more real in my digital life than I do in my physical life, which is a little bit scary, but not, not, not surprising because it is so immersive, okay? So that's the big deal. And then the third thing is mobile. So, so then instead of going to the information, the information is always with you. The, 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 the notion is if there's anything next to you 24 by seven, it is your cell phone and therefore you're continually, continually engaged with this. For the unenfranchised folks who could not afford any other access to the internet, mobile devices are that. There are now more mobile devices on the planet than there are people, and in a very, very large number of those are in the hands of people that could, this is their very first access to, to systems of engagement. So all of a sudden we've had this, this massive thing, and, the, and, the, and it's, it's not lost on anybody that this is, this is stuff people want to use. This is what people extend, want, want to extend the resources. So the issue is, is not that we don't get it. The issue is this was set up entirely as a consumer infrastructure. Everybody in this room participates in an enterprise system of, of engagement. We want the dynamics of the consumer system of engagement. But as John Mancini was saying, as we were working through these issues at AIM and the work we were doing with him, they need to be the dynamics of the consumer system, but with under the, 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 the standards and the responsibilities and, the, and frankly the liabilities of the enterprise system. And that's, that's where this stuff is getting hung up, okay? Because the CIOs totally get this, but they're saying, slow down, we've got, we got a bunch of, we got a bunch of things in the road here. And it's not just technical things. What I want to share with you are the organizational things, but they're parallel to each other, and each needs to respect the other. So if you think about this, this digital impact, you say, look, okay, volunteer time, very scarce resource, much of it is lost to friction. What is glorious about, you know, that little telephone code thing, and all of a sudden, you know, I've got my QR code, or I can go and, and get immediately to a certain place, great, great, once I've adopted it, once I've adopted it. But this issue of adoption, which has been my life's work, is how does that adoption stuff play out? I'm going to share with you some dynamics about that in just a second. Your end users, the good news is you do not need to buy anything for them. In fact, the whole enterprise has sort of thought, wow, all that money we spent on PCs, Maybe not anymore. Maybe we're done. Maybe we let the user bring their own endpoint. Now that creates a whole bunch of technical issues, but at the margin, the user's happier and, and there's a lot of capital that doesn't get deployed against, against a highly changing end user device. P pretty, pretty interesting opportunity, right? The issue is, yeah, but, and there's always that yeah, but. In fact, most people who live in organizational change, yeah, but, that's sort of like, let's just put it on a poster and I'll just look at it every day. But the issue here is it's not that easy to do. And, 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 and so this notion of where would you focus these things first and why would you focus them there as opposed to just try to do it everywhere all at once. This issue around collaboration, that's where, that's where the work took us uh, when we were working uh, with John and his team. But here's kind of a quick diagnostic to kind of get a sense of, well, so where, where is my organization? Where are we? So everything on the left is kind of what we all grew up with. And by the way, good stuff, good stuff. I mean, that was the, the, that was the backbone of how you ran a volunteer organization. I was the head of the Cub Scouts for Palo Alto for three years, okay? I lived in that black world. And it worked, it worked. But there's a lot of friction and it doesn't scale and particularly it doesn't have 900 million members as our friends at Facebook just passed, right? So you look on the right and you say, is there anything on the right that's a word there that I haven't seen before or that I don't know about? I think, no, no, I, I, I know all the words on the right, right? I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily, I'm not 
uh, the, well, actually, I am logged into most of those now, but that was largely because of my job. I think with my demographic, I wouldn't have been, but I am, I'm in. But, but, but connecting the two, and, and, and which ones do you connect first? Because if you just try to wholesale forklift your organization from the left to the right, that can't be the right answer. Can't be. It's just it's too much. There's just too much movement at too great social disruption. So, so there's got to be some way of saying, how do I think through a migration from the left to the right? Which ones are the kind of no-brainers? Let's let, let's take the no-brainers off the table. But then fairly quickly, there's some bets. And part of what I want to do is kind of help you think about the bets that you would make. And and the, and the idea here is simply, if we got more on the right. We would free up more volunteer time. That time is the time that we want to reallocate to the new. We want to take out of the old and reallocate to the new. And part of what's trapping it in the old is the mechanisms of the old. And part of what will allow it to go to the new is to be repotted into these new communication and collaboration mechanisms. So that's where this is, 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 is headed. So collaborative systems of engagement. This is a kind of a new idea for the enterprise. Because the enterprise historically was built much more in a command and control model. It was built much more in like we do it all ourselves. But in that 90s, with the, with the outsourcing and all the, all the business process reengineering, we started contracting with other companies to do more and more and more of the total workload. Now all of a sudden, there's a huge requirement to communicate and collaborate and coordinate across, across enterprise boundaries. And in a volunteer organization, it is inherently across boundaries and inherently uh, uh, collaborative because the whole purpose is to gather resources to bring other people together. You don't gather resources to do the work inside. You're, doing, you're creating a fabric. The, the weaving of that fabric falls on the middle of the organization. The volunteered time is spent weaving the social fabric that will allow you to accomplish the mission of your organization. So it's not any more transactional. So, so transact, it's not about transaction systems. There's a little bit of transaction stuff to worry about, but it's not, it's not material. It's not you, the top executive, thinking great strategic thoughts, because you don't scale. right? It's everybody in the middle. And when we look at the IT systems and what we've invested in people in the middle, at least in large um, uh, the kind of corporations that are my clients, we didn't invest very much. We spent all that money on ERP and stuff that was all for the transactional worker. We spent a ton of money on business intelligence and executive dashboards. That was for the, you know, the, the executive suite. And if you were in the middle and you got a laptop and a Blackberry, it's like, good luck. You're done, right? That's it. Maybe a cell phone. Yeah, you mean, maybe Black, Blackberry be it. OK. So t time to invest in IT for the middle tier. And this is something that, that the, you, uh, you guys in this room, I think, are going to be ahead of the enterprise, not because you're early adopters by nature, but because so much of your workload is inherently collaborative, whereas in larger corporations, they can find ways to try to postpone this challenge for a little while longer. I don't see how, I don't see how associations can postpone this, because this association and social share a number of letters in the middle of those words, and there's a reason for that. And therefore, the socialness of, your, of, your, of, your, the, of the very essence of who you are, I think, demands that you get here sooner than, than maybe some of your brethren, and maybe some of the organizations that sponsor you, you're likely to be uh, a, a, an early leader. Uh, so systems of engagement, the good news is you do not have to think about what they should look like. They're done. They're just done for a different purpose. We know that they have to be mobile. We know they have to be social. They don't ad hoc in real time, just like Open Table, Yelp, you know, X, uh, Xpedia, Wikipedia, you know, just whatever it is, right? We, that, that's not the hard part. The hard part is how do you put this word enterprise in front of these things? And you think, well, maybe I don't have to. Now, and I think actually that this is a really important sort of bet issue for you to think about. How secure do your communication and collaboration systems need to be? And can you actually build a sociogram of, well, there are some that have to be very secure, some that are not so secure forward? Because the less secure they need to be, the faster you can adopt the consumer processes. But conversely, as you need to have accountability or, or compliance or security 
or any form of, uh, 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 you know, of, of, of liability control or, or whatever, you need to put this word enterprise back into the spec for the system. And, and that's where the thoughtfulness has to happen. And, that, and this is where the change management is, is, is kind of the hardest to, to bring off. And I think it's going to vary a bunch here, but a number of you are in the medical community. And in the medical community, you know, there's just too much around HIPAA and the, and, and the data stuff. There's just, you're going to have to put some stuff in front of this. Even though it's obvious these systems will change the wellness relationship with, 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 with the, between patients and health givers. Uh, there's lots and lots of ways to do it, but it needs to be enterprise enabled. And a number of you are also in the CPA, the financial community. And again, you know, there's just data that's, that's private. And so you have to figure out how to work. But again, wouldn't it be helpful to have a bunch of these things to improve communication between client and, and CPA going forward? So this notion of, of adding the word enterprise. And so you say, well, well but don't worry about it, Jeff, because Google and Facebook and Apple, they'll do this. And the answer is no, they won't. No. They're going to continue to do their job, which is to continually move the boundary of the consumer experience in this relatively loosely secured world. That is their gift to the planet, and they've got a lot more to give. They are not going to slow themselves down, which is what you have to do to put the word enterprise in here, and do the heavy lifting to do this. Now, there's a bunch of enterprise vendors who totally get the heavy lifting of enterprise, but who have been kind of clueless on the consumer experience of these, of these tools. So this is the challenge. I got people that understand enterprise, I got people that understand Facebook. I don't got so many folks that understand enterprise Facebook, and in fact, it kind of has to be invented as we go along. And I think the, 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 the people at Microsoft, I think the people at Hewlett Packard, I think the people at, at IBM, at Dell, at Accenture, I think they're all, they all get this. The CIOs are going, guys, would you please help us out here? I think they're looking for some early places to engage, and I would think that your organizations would be attractive places for them to start, because they're not quite as, not, you, don't, you don't necessarily want to start with you know, nuclear secrets, right? It'd be nice to start with something a little, a little, a little easier. So what would we get out of this stuff? You know, so I, if we had an enterprise Facebook and we were trying to do some fundraising, well, who knows the head of business development at IBM? We need to work on this deck right now. We've got to get together, so I need an on-demand Skype kind of thing. You know, where's Sherry? Well, nobody knows where Sherry is except Sherry's cell phone. But Sherry's cell phone knows where Sherry is. We can find Sherry, right? And, and, and can you help me promote this in the community? YouTube is becoming this amazing opportunity to demo or recruit or, or share stuff. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. How much do we spend? It, you can find out stuff you know, more automatically, get, get through things. I'm just going to add more stuff. But Twitter, getting the buzz going. App stores, I want to make sure everybody does this thing in the exact same way. I mean, the tools are there. The tools are there. Now, there's so many of them, and you, there's, you know, it's like that thing about you know, so many whatever, so little time, whether it's so many books, so many women, as some people have said, so many bottles of wine, as I might say, so little time. There's, how would you focus this? How would you say, okay, I get it. I'm not stupid. I get it. How, would, which, how do you decide where to go first? How do we play this game? Okay? But at least this stuff is the kind of stuff we, we, we want. Well, part of what you have to understand about going first is you have to understand the appetite of your organization for change. Now, if you'll notice, if you, I've spent a bunch of time studying technology adoption dynamics, and there's a, a, a curve here, an adoption curve that was originally uh, developed by a guy named Everett Rogers in the 50s. But basically, what Everett discovered was when you introduce disruptive change into any community, the community will self-segregate into five different strategies for embracing or rejecting the change. The innovators, the visionaries, or early adopters, he called them the early adopters, the early majority, we ended up calling them the pragmatists, the late majority, we ended up calling the conservatives, and then the laggards, okay? And each one of these has, has an approach to change. So the, the, the innovators, it just wants to embrace it just to see how it works. The early adopter wants to go ahead of the herd in order to set the new tone and get a competitive advantage, or at least to jump on things. I, I want to solve this problem before it gets too big. The pragmatist waits for the problem to build to be big enough to really be worth dealing with, and also waits until the, 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 the new idea has been vetted enough that it looks like it's safe to use. The conservative tries to postpone this stuff as long as possible, wants it to get cheaper, simpler, easier, and even when it happens, they're not really happy, and the laggards believes that this is all an instrument of the devil. 
So what happens, and we looked at this thing and we said, well, this is easy, high-tech marketing, start on the left, work to your right. What's your question, right? Well, here's what actually happened. What actually happens is the first two constituencies team up and secede from the bell curve. And they go way early. By the way, one of them is named Hugh, and another one is named Don, okay? And these guys are gonna say, look, we, we wanna we we stake out the new turf. We wanna we want show you what's possible. We wanna do it now. We're the early adopters. We do it for competitive advantage. We do it, frankly, because it's our gift. We wanna show you where to go. That's great. But it creates something that we ended up calling the chasm. And the chasm is that lull in adoption. When the early adopters have gone in and shown that it's possible, but the pragmatists are still going, I, I, I don't know, I don't know. And what pragmatists do during the chasm is they talk to each other. So they love a conference like this. And they say, when they see a break, they'll go, so are you, uh, are you doing that? No, 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 no. Okay, me neither, good, okay, good, all right, good. Okay, in other words, I don't have to yet, right? If, if I can postpone, I will postpone. Is, is there a seminar I can go to about it? Good, perfect, I wanna go to a seminar, right. Yeah, right, so anything to kind of push it off, right? Okay, that's the chasm. Now what ha so, how, so there's actually, you gotta start the adoption wave twice, right? What would start the second group going is inside that group of pragmatists, there are these niches of markets we call pragmatists in pain. Now, a pragmatist in pain has now gotten to the point where the status quo is just not working. And in fact, the consequences are getting worse and worse and worse. And their organization is now under pressure to do something, or frankly, we will find somebody who can. Okay? And at that point, a pragmatist in pain becomes, their attitude toward adoption changes pretty dramatically. And so now they're open, they're still not, they're, they're not, happy, and they're not looking for all the possibilities. That's what drove the visionaries. They're looking for, no, 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 no. I need a solution to this problem. I can't solve it with my existing technology. Can you help me solve this? If you can help me solve this, and if you will show up and stay here until it's solved, we'll do it. And that's what those niche markets are about. They're about early adoption of technology that solves a, it's only doing a handful of what it eventually will do, but it's incredibly important to get that done right now. So part of what you might think about your organization is, if we're a pragmatic organization, think about your pain points where the organization would go, I don't know about all this technology, but if you could do something to fix the registration problem, or if you could do something to fix you know, the, 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 the phone tree problem, whatever the problem is, then okay, I'll put in with you. Now eventually, the technology does become pervasive, and at that point, it's like, I, I go back to another meeting, this is now Digital Impact 2013, and I, go back and I raise that same issue, are you, are you doing this, are you doing this? And I'm kind of going like this, and you're going, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, and I go, oh shit, okay, okay, I have to too, okay? So that causes what we call the tornado. So the tornado is when like everybody just rushes in and, and, and does it together. It's exactly like the chasm, only opposite, right? The chasm was you aren't, you aren't, you aren't, me neither. And the tornado was, you are, you are, you are, oh my gosh, okay? So, 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 that, so that's how, so there's this really jerky experience of, of uh, adoption. And there's a, this is where Malcolm Gladwell's idea of the tipping point became so important. Because until you cross the tipping point, if you stop sort of putting energy into the effort, the organization will actually go back to the status quo. Once you cross the tipping point, when you withdraw the effort, the organization goes forward to the destination. So the idea about resource application is you must not withdraw the resources you know, uh, too early. And the book Escape Velocity is mostly directed toward uh, financial corp you know, corporations in the Fortune 500. Routinely, they withdraw the resources too early and routinely they do not get escape velocity. But when they don't and when it works, it's, it's extremely good outcome. But in, in our situation, we have more control and, and frankly less excuse for doing that. And then you get onto Main Street, and Main Street is, yeah, of course. I mean, everybody has a cell phone. What's your question, right? Well, it wasn't so long ago that everybody didn't have a cell phone, right? Or if they had one, it looked like, you know, Maxwell Smart that, that, that uh, Hugh was showing us. Now, I want to show a video. You know, it's all very well to talk about that in the abstract. I want to run a video, which is going to, I'm going to narrate a video to you. This is of a, uh, so we run the video now. This is of a music festival, from a music festival in uh, Snoqu uh, uh, Snoqualmie Falls in, in Washington. It's called the Sasquatch 209. 
And as you can see, there's a young organizational director who's in the middle, see, he's looking to get the people on the program, right? He has an idea, he has a dream, this is a sunny day, we're celebrating life, it's 2009, it's not, we're in Washington and it's not raining. I mean, come on, people. And, and you can see, I mean, he's doing, and he's, he, now he's not particularly gifted. Okay, okay. But he has energy, he has enthusiasm. Oh, he's trying, will you, could, no, 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 oh, your zipper's down. Okay, okay, no, I, okay. Tried to get his early recruit, nobody's buying his act. Look at him, they're just all, they're kind of being careful not to make eye contact, you know? Kind of like, ah, it's like in New York, you know? I'm not gonna look at the guy at the subway. Okay, no, no. But, he, but has he stopped? No. Has he run out of energy? Is he, is he giving up? Is his, head, is his head dragging? All those reasons why you have when you're in the middle of launching a campaign and frankly, it's just not working. Nobody is getting there, but he, he's, he hangs in there, right? He, he's, we're about a quarter to a third of the way through the video. He's got some new moves. N no, but no, nobody's buying. Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay, his first volunteer. His first volunteer. This is a big, big moment. Not equally untalented, I might add, but, but, but you know, but, but okay, but we're working it. We're working it, you know? And, and, and often that volunteer has more energy. Look, look, look at him. He's going to give a, yeah, oh, yeah, yes, he's, he's, he's pumped. He's pumped. Come on down. You got to do this. And, and you're thinking, well, okay, but no, here's the third guy. Okay, okay. <laughs> Now, we're still a little nerdy, frankly. This looks a little bit like the Big Bang Theory. But, but you know, but, but yeah, and we're kind of, but we're, we're, we're recruiting. You know, maybe, maybe if we could get maybe just one or two other people to, oh, okay, maybe that'll help them kind of come down. Oh, here, oh, okay, five. Now, no guys yet, no, I mean, all guys. Oh, women, women, oh, this could be good. This could be good. Now we have eight, 10, 12. Okay, now, now something's starting to happen. It's not quite so lonely out there. It's not a crowd, but it's, Hey, what's going on over on the other side of the field? You can watch people kind of turn their heads a little bit. Okay, wait, well, now, now. oh, we got to get in on this. Okay, okay, now, has, have we reached the tipping point yet? I, well, well not, and there's some more people are running in. This is looking good. This is looking good. Okay, we got, can't quite see our entrepreneur anymore, but I think he's in there somewhere. Oh, and then here comes some more, some more. Okay, it, it's, it, it, and now, my God, this is a movement, okay? Okay, and, 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 and more and more people are coming in. The, the, you can, now you can kind of feel like we've got to hurry because if we don't get in now, we're going to be left behind, okay? And so now we've got this entire area of the field, and it is filled. It is filled. And, and, and you, you watch over, and by, people are actually noticing them, right? Look what's going on over there, right? So this is kind of like, this is how it happens. Now you say, that is past the tipping point. We have adoption. But it's not obvious for you to say, at what point did we get adoption? One of the things CEOs have told me is, you know, Jeffrey, it's a lot easier to see this in retrospect than when you're trying to make the bets going forward. But at least w w we got there, and this thing ends with a, with a really cute thing, uh, which I think will help everybody in the room because everyone in the room is just one person, right? And, and so, so th that's what this is about. Okay, so we could go back to, to, to the slideshow. What's cool about that is, there's something that happens, and, so, and this is what makes volunteer organizations, and by the way, a lot of business is basically voluntary too, right? Uh, where people just help each other through a web of favors just to get things done. But, but as you look at this stuff, um, you say, it's so important to get to that tipping point. You cannot see the tipping point until it's passed. So the problem is at any given time, when you're making your bet, you still haven't reached the tipping point, and there are increasing arguments for, you know what, this isn't working. This isn't working. We, we, should, we, should, we should cut back. We, we have to fold this thing back in. And, the, and, the, and by the way, sometimes, presumably, that's true, right? There are some things that just fla fail. But the problem with these ones is every one of these is a little bit like biking uphill. Once you get over the hill and you're going downhill, you are a star, right? And, but, and in your speed, you'll be going 30, 20, 30 miles an hour, whatever it is, right? But when you're going up the hill, you know, and when you start on the hill, you're going 10 miles an hour, but then you're going up the hill, eight, seven, six, four, and all of a sudden the CFO says, two miles an hour? What, can't you bike? What's the matter with you? I think you should get off the bike, right? We can get a car, take a bus, right? And, and so at that point, which is the hardest point to stay the course, it's just before, before the tipping point. So part of what I want to do with this, this slide is to say, what would I do? How would I know? How could I manage? 
in this fog of adoption to work on something rationally and still at some point, at some point if somebody pulls the plug, we're gonna pull the plug, but not pull the plug too early. So we spent some time with folks who are building digital media businesses on the web. And I think they've, got, they've taught us a lot of lessons. And the way they play this game, they say, look, usually they play it from a dorm room. Usually they're about 19 or 20 years old. Did you forget to become a billionaire on your way through your 20s? <laughs> See, me too. I just, damn, I forgot this part. But anyway, they're sitting in a dorm and say, what, how did you build your, how did you build Zappos? How did you build Facebook? How did you, here's what they'll tell you. We're sitting in the dorm, we, we're on the web, we're trying to figure out, could we get people to come to something? Could we acquire people to come to our site? If we could, could we engage them? Could we get them to kind of do whatever it was we wanted to do, play our game, click through our stuff, do whatever it is? Um, this one was actually postponed for a lot of time, but there was always in the back of the mind, could this ever be monetized, whatever. Now, by the way, in this room, monetization might look like behavioral or social change. It's, it's essentially, it's the payoff for your mission, whatever that would be. And could we enlist people to maybe help us acquire the next people? And so what these people would do is they'd run experiments. And they'd run these experiments. It looks like they're running linearly here. But in fact, they would run them kind of in parallel. Can I do something with acquisition, engagement? What about monetization? Can I enlist some people? If I could enlist some people, could that help me acquire more people? If I could inquire more people, can I get them more deeply engaged? If I got them more deeply engaged, could I get the monetization gear going? And spin, 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 spin. And, to get to that tornado, to get to that thing at the end of the, uh, uh, of the dance. And so when you stood back from that and said, look, the, the first thing I was able to learn from this thing is, at least according to, to the folks I talked to, there's not a fifth gear, okay? So there's four gears. The second concept was two of the gears are the gears that people measure all the time. How many people are coming? So how many heads are showing up? How many people attended this record sold out site? People want to know that. And the other thing is they, they always want to look at the monetization gear. So what was paid, how, what was the return, impact, wh whatever it was. Whether that was, you know, and you can, you can measure impact by whatever uh, objective measures you want. Interestingly, it's the other two gears that are the power gears. The power of engagement is, has to do with how deeply did people get involved and it leads to how much they will contribute to the monetization outcome you, of your organization. Again in terms of your mission, right, where it goes. And it may be a monetary mission, but it doesn't have to be. And the other power gear is the enlistment gear, which is can you get folks to actually enlist and recruit and help you acquire the next wave as opposed to having to do it entirely uh, through, through your own efforts. And of looking at these four gears and sort of thinking about uh, uh, bringing it into the enterprise, to me, this is the decade where we want to work a lot on the engagement gear. The theory of the gears is at any given quarter, one of these gears is going slower than the other three. And your job is to speed up that gear, okay? So you have to think about each quarter, what gear is it, and how would I speed it up and, and, and work, on that, uh, work on speeding up that gear, okay? The interesting thing I, I, I would just say right now, though, is the engagement gear is the gear that kind of is the gift that keeps on giving. And so when we look at systems of engagement, we say, Wow, if we could get deeper engagement, how would the systems of engagement affect the engagement gear here? And the idea is focus them on moments of engagement. So it's the moments of engagement. So moments of engagement, the idea came from a concept called moments of truth, which, uh, which a number of people have used in strategy, which say, you know, in any given strategy, there's a handful of moments in the life cycle of a customer relationship or the life cycle of a product or the life cycle of a marketing campaign or the life cycle of, of an initiative or the attempt to get a bill through Congress or a, a regulatory uh, compliance or an FDA test, there, whatever it is, and then the health or the, 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 the treatment of a, of, of a patient. It's not homogeneous. There are moments of truth where turning points, inflection points, where things can go either way. The, the really heavy lifting here and the really intellectually tough thought here is what are our moments of truth, really? And the, you can't like look them up on page 22, right? This is where you get your best people in the organization and you look each other in the eye and you try to figure it out. What are our moments of truth? That if we perform brilliantly in that moment, if that moment really catches fire, everything else works, okay? And then who is present in that moment of truth? Who in our organization, who in our ecosystem is present in that moment of truth and then 
as we look at all this wonderful technology and these systems of engagement from the consumer world, is there anything from that sort of whole barrel of tricks that we should be pulling over now in order to change the power of our representative in the moment of truth to create a higher probability of a much better outcome in that moment? So it's, the idea is rather than pilot this stuff in places that don't matter, this is the opposite strategy. This is no, no, no. Pilot it right at the heart of the matter, okay? And see what we can do to re-engineer that moment using these things. Because they, they certainly look like they ought to be fabulous. That's where we want to have them pay off. So use these questions to target your first project on moments that matter. And it's a way of bringing the community in because you talk first about the moment and only later about the technology. The technology is only a vehicle to, to changing the moment. So we recruit and enlist through the moment, but then we're going to engage through the technology. At least that's the idea. So final takeaway, and then we're going to take a little, uh, a little break here and, uh, and, and reassemble for Q&A. But just some people often say, well, you know, I went to this thing for three days, and I, didn't, I, I need to come back with action items. If for no other reason than my conscious, you know, I was at Disney World. What did I do? Okay, so I got to come back with action items. Okay, so this is the action item checklist, right? Just in case you, if you feel that way. Personally, I think you just ought to enjoy Disneyland. It's a pretty cool place. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and you need a break. Okay. Uh, first thing to do. Okay, review your strategy and identify your top priority moments of engagement. Even if you do nothing else on this exercise, if even that was the only thing you did, I think that might change your perspective on how you allocate your personal time in your organizational time. But having done that, you, and you, if going in the digital impact part of your life and going toward this thing, okay, so what systems of engagement could change that? And what's cool about the technology fair here and what's cool about the digital orientation and the early adopter orientation of guys like you and Don and other people here, you will get plenty of advice and plenty of ideas if you ask the question. If you came to the technology community and said, this is our moment of engagement, what can you do for us? That's very, very different than saying, oh, what does that gizmo do, right? It's a totally different dialogue. Right? Third, third piece of this thing, think about your own organization. Not, some organizations are inherently early adopting oriented, and you guys should just go as fast as you possibly can. Some organizations are really, really conservative. And you just have to understand, you're not going to be first. Doesn't mean you can't be a pragmatist in pain for that one, that one uh, problem area, though. That's when you should be thinking about adopting, just being, is there a problem area we can address? And if you're a pragmatic organization, I think they'll give you some experiment to experiment, uh, some permission to experiment, but they won't really get on board until you have that pragmatist in pain moment. That's what will get them on board uh, uh, going forward. But you have to think about who are we. Don't, don't try to be something that your organization doesn't want to be or won't give you permission to be. So once you do that, however, in any organization, it, it just your organization will seg self-segregate into the early adopters and the pragmatists and the conservatives. And the key point here is identify your early adopters and work with them first, right? I mean, let's get it, let, let's, we don't need to have naysayers right at the beginning. That's not when they're helpful. Naysaying is a helpful contribution, but not at the very beginning, okay? So get the early adopters into this game. Get help. <laughs> not to put it too finely, but I'm sure your son can design a website. Not this one, okay? The, the point being, user experience design, this whole thing is about, is about, is about the user experience. And so you want, getting, designing the user experience, there is so, that this is the crucible in which you have the most uh, uh, chance to, to, to inflect change. So get somebody, spend money here. Get something really, really cool here. Something where, where the actual experience is compelling uh, a lot. Microsoft got way behind Apple, right? I mean, I think n nobody at Microsoft would argue about that. I don't know if you've seen this new Windows 8 mobile operating system thing. It is way cool. It is way cool. And it's, it's a, so you say you, Microsoft is giving itself a chance uh, uh, to kind of to, to get back in the game. Use anecdotal feedback from those early adopters to create the case for the board to make the big investment, okay? So, so, so in other words, the first rollout, you roll out with friendlies, and you try to capture the, capture the impact, particularly on, on the moment of engagement. That's the thing you bring to your board to say, okay, I now want to actually reallocate resources, reallocate the inertial momentum of our organization going forward, 
And then finally, focus on the pragmatist investment and get that critical pain point. That critical pain point is the easiest place for you to introduce change management. Pragmatists in pain are predisposed to change, and pragmatists make very good references for other pragmatists and conservatives. The problem with pilots is pilots don't make good references for pragmatists because pragmatists are very aware uh, that they are not in the pilot-oriented community. But if another pragmatist does this, that's pretty cool. Okay, so right now it's time for us, I think, to take a break. Uh, do, do you want to come back up and, and, and do that, Don? I'm going to say thank you very much. We're going to have a cool Q&A session right after break, so I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks.